and God's ladies say, Amen. You may be seated. Well, today we're going to be opening our Bibles to Romans 13 as we study Lesson 17, as we look at the government's authority as well as a believer's response. Paul continues this thought from last week in Romans 12, 1 and 2, where we saw that as we present our bodies a living sacrifice, as we choose to stop being conformed to this world and allow God to transform us by the renewing of our mind, it will be evident in us being and doing according to his will. Following how we should overcome evil with good, how we are to love and pray for those who persecute us. Today in Romans chapter 13, we continue to see how we should be as believers. And it's seen in how we respond to those not only in the body of Christ, but those who come against us both in the body, saint and sinner. And then in Romans 13, 1 through 7, specifically, we see how we should act toward the government. Unfortunately, the children of Israel rejected God as king. And any of you that have been studying through First and Second Chronicles, you see the pattern of the kings of this world appointed by man. They're good, they're bad, they're good, they're bad, they're wicked, and they're good, then they're wicked and wicked, and then they're good and good, and then wicked and wicked and wicked. And it's just bad. It's bad when we allow man to rule over us and not God. But God has given man a free will. And so he said to the children of Israel, have it your way. And he allowed man to be appointed as king to rule over them. Now, the only good king is the king of kings, ultimately, and that is Jesus Christ. He is our king of kings. Now, as way of background, Paul's drawing the attention to a contrast between those who wanted man to rule over them as king and then there were the religious Jews who refused to recognize an earthly king, and they would only pay taxes to God alone. They would not pay taxes to the earthly king. Now, it's important also to remember, in fact, this is a vital thing to remember, that Paul wrote Romans 13 during the Roman Empire. And unfortunately, under the Roman rule, it was fiercely persecuted for the Christian. They would kill Christians. In fact, Pontius Pilate was of the Roman government, and we know what he did, right? Jesus was crucified under his kingship. And then Paul, who lived during one of the or the most wicked ruler, Roman emperor Caesar Nero, he was wicked of wicked. I mean, he killed his own mother and his own wife, and he just was disgusting when it came to Christians. He would light them on poles to light the garden, dip them in tar, and set them on fire while they were alive, and that would light his garden as he would ride his chariot every night through the gardens. I mean, wicked, wicked, wicked. And this is who was emperor when Paul wrote Romans 13. Now, Paul and Jesus both were under this example of the submission to this government, and it applies to us today as he still says that Christians are to submit to the governing authorities. Now, we know that the government is wicked. We know that there's improprieties throughout of our government, inside and out. It's terrible what the government does sometimes. But I'm here to tell you it's not any worse than Nero's government. And so we've got to keep this in mind. It's super important for us to remember this as we read through Romans 13. We might not like it or agree with it, but the Bible teaches it, so we seek his ability to fulfill it. Amen? Then in verse, so in verse 1, he first speaks of submission. He says, let every soul, every soul, not just believers, not unbelievers, but every soul be subject to the governing authorities, regardless of who they are. And don't think it's the concepts isolated because Peter also talks about this. So it's not just Paul's idea that he's writing about. We see in 1 Peter 2.13 that he said, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to king as supreme or governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Why? Well, verse 15 says, This is the will of of God. Last week we saw that it was the will of God for us to put our bodies on the altar as a living sacrifice, right? So that we could prove the good will of God. But he says that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. 
as free, yet not using liberty or your freedom as a cloak for vice or an excuse to sin, but as bondservants of God. And he goes on to say, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. And that's what our life is to look like as the world looks at us as the church. And, and again, it is the will of God for us. It's so simple. Since the government has authority from God, we are bound to obey them. Now, I know it's hard for most of us to swallow, if not all of us, mostly, again, because we see the corruption. We see it on so many fronts. Fronts. They're passing legislation against God's design for creation, and we could go on and on and on. The Bible calls us, though, to submit to the government without question. We don't like that, do we? It's not good. I was going, my grandson stayed home last night from church, and so my son said, if he stays home, you have to do a Bible study with him, Mom. I said, no problem. We're going to talk about obedience and submission. So I took him through chapter 13 of Romans, and he was like, he really thought that was interesting how the government and the schools are teaching the kids. And he gave me some examples, and I'm like, you are so right, Asher. But however, it's a time that we, is there a time that we don't submit? And he was talking about that. He asked me that question right before we got to this. And I, I'm sure that you remember from our study back in Acts, it's one of my favorite stories. You can turn to chapter three of the book of Acts if you would like to follow along. But it was that time when Peter and John were going to the Temple Mount and they came up to the gate beautiful and they saw a man laying at the gate beautiful. And in Acts 3.3, 3, they were about to go into the temple and this lame man asks for alms. In verse 4 of Acts 3, and fixing his eyes on him with, G, with, Pete, with John, Peter said, look at us. So this man gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand, the right hand, and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood up, walked, and entered into the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Isn't that amazing? But then down in Acts 4.14, when the high priests and the rulers and the scribes saw this man who they knew was lame, and had been laying there forever, so it would seem. It says that the man who had been healed standing with them, with Peter and John, they could say nothing against it because they knew. But, verse 15, the council conferred among themselves, and in verse 16 they said, what shall we do with these men, speaking of Peter and John? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it, but, so that it spreads no further. I mean, how sad is that? That let us severely threaten them. Now, these were the governing authorities. And in verse 18, they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But verse 19, Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is in the right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you go ahead and judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now, we see this over and over throughout the Old Testament. One person after another who takes a stand and does what God calls them to do, regardless of what the government says, because it is against what God calls them to do. We saw it with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, with Nebuchadnezzar, a wicked king, who set up that gold image and they refused to bow down to that statue of Nebuchadnezzar and was thrown into the fiery furnace. But God supernaturally protected them. They came out not even smelling like smoke. We see it with Daniel. Back in, in Daniel 6, with the governors and the authorities made that decree that no one could pray to any god other than the statue that was erected for Darius for 30 days. And of course, Daniel went home. What did he do? He opens his windows towards Jerusalem and kneels down and prays for everyone to see, breaking the law. 
which sent him into the lion's den, where we all know the story, but God supernaturally stopped the mouths of the lions, and it spared Daniel's life as he refused to obey the government, but instead honored God. So it seems that when the government commands us to do something contrary to what the word of God says, or we could say our commission to, to give out the good news of Jesus Christ, to speak the name of Jesus, or tries to come in between our relationship with God Almighty, tries to keep us from going to that throne room of God to find help in our time of need through that uh, prayer time with Jesus. So it seems that that is the exception. And then Paul gives three reasons why we are to submit to the governing authorities as long as they don't go against God's word, continuing in verse 1. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. As we think about this, this is saying that the government actually has a ministry from God. Have you ever thought about that? I used to think of politicians as like the lowest of the lows because there's so many snaky ones, you know, until we went with David Barton and toured the, White, toured the, the Library of Congress and the Capitol in Washington, D.C., and we met with with representatives and senators and congressmen. And we actually, I can remember like it was yesterday, actually standing one-on-one -on -one with Michelle Bachman and praying with that woman. She is on fire for Jesus Christ. And she is fighting for the rights of believers in our society. And that's when my eyes were open to the fact that, holy moly, this is a ministry. And these guys are up here all by themselves. We went back to the hotel room, and the, the local news channel, channel had the uh, top 10 wax in Washington, D.C., and every single one of them that the news media put on television was a born-again Christian that we had prayed with that day. Talk about persecution. And man, our government, those that are serving Jesus Christ, being salt and light in our government, need our prayers so much. And so many times we forget about them or write them off as politicians that kind of, you know, turn our stomach in some respects. So they need our, our prayers and they are in ministry as much as those who are in the church full time. They need our prayers as well. In fact, God says in Proverbs 8, 15, that by, my, by me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles all the judges of the earth. Have you ever thought about God being over all the judges even with some of the, the decisions that are brought down? I don't know about you, but I need this reminder. As we see what we think is so much injustice. How many of you were at the Wind Leaders Lead Conference this last weekend? A few of you. We had the privilege of able to hear from Hannah Overton, who had five children, mother of, no, mother of four or five, I forget, but she fostered a little boy who had an eating disorder that he would eat anything and everything. Well, he got into some spices, and he overdosed on spices, and he died. And the state went after her for capital murder. She's a missionary's daughter that grew up in a Christian book bubble, brought this child into her life because she wanted to minister to him and become his forever family. She was pregnant at the time, and they convicted her of capital murder unbelievable. But as you hear her story, and it was life without parole in maximum security prison for this sweet spirited little girl. And her story is amazing. In fact, we're going to have a ladies night out and watch the doc documentary because it is just so good with this point. But, but the, the neat thing is she went to this jail God supernaturally protected her, put her in solitary confinement. And then the very first night she gets put into a ward, she's head to head with this girl who recognizes that she's not going to last a moment. She's going to get killed. So she decides she's going to be her defender. Ends up that all 120, now listen, all 120 women in her ward get saved. And she leaves this place. Her, her thing is overturned. She leaves and she left that prison, that maximum security prison, every single woman is saved and they're continuing to do Bible studies. In fact, it's spilling over into the other wards and she requested like 350 touched and transformed books that I just wrote because she wants to take it back into them and have them do a Bible study with it. Amazing when we look and we're obedient, even when we see what we think is injustices, 
God can change it and use it for the good, as we saw in Romans chapter 8. Unfortunately, we have such limited perspective. I know I do. Every moment I see things happening and I get so caught up in the moment by moment and I forget to take that step back and say, you know, it's got to get worse before it's going to get better sometimes, right? And then we see God step in and do the impossible. That's when we know that God is able to work out anything and everything beyond our expectation and he will use even the wicked officials as we watch him be in control. Now, we don't like it because we're not omniscient. That's really the bottom line. We don't see everything. But God's like up there in that helicopter, and he sees the beginning of the parade from the end of the parade. We're just on the corner, and we just see one little float at a time go by. God's up here, and he's looking, and he sees the whole thing, and he says, just trust me. I got it. And that's hard to do when you're thrown into a maximum security prison, amen, when you're innocent. Unbelievable. Modern day Joseph. Well, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 tells us that his ways are not our ways, but his ways are higher than our ways. They're past finding out. And there's no way of knowing that God's working until we see evidence. Isn't that true? Yet God tells us that we're to walk by faith. What is faith? Faith is the evidence of things not seen. We just simply are to walk by faith and trust the only trustworthy one, and that is God. Now, while this is speaking of the government and the world, and this is where I had fun with my grandson last night, as way of application, we know that God has set up government in the church and even within our families. As I was telling him, you need to obey your father because God put him as the authority over you. As Christ is the head of the church, he has appointed people in the church to oversee. And so too, our husbands, now listen, we don't like this, and it goes against the world, but our husbands are head over our marriages. I, we, you know, it always amazes me. We have no problem saying Christ is head of the church, do we? We want Christ to be head of the church. But boy, when it comes down to our husbands being over us, Ooh, now them are fighting words, right? We have a problem with that. But Jesus said, just as Christ is head over the church, so too our husbands are head over us. Now, we don't have to like it or agree with everything, but as we take a step back and we submit our opinions to the Lord, as we pray and we watch God work it out for his glory, we will be in his perfect will. Doesn't that bring peace? You know, Satan wants to, to think that we're free to go do whatever we want to do. He tells us that we're free to go sin, we're free to go be in charge, we're free to go do all this stuff. And really what it is, is he's bringing us slowly under his bondage. Because that's not the truth. The truth is Jesus Christ came to set us free. And as we lay ourselves on those altars and we die then we are truly free to live for eternity. Well, back to Romans 13 and verse 2. We see that our submission is important because, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, so we don't have to be afraid of them if we obey the law, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Well, it's simple. Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. And as we see that our lives should look like this as Christians, we should be the best citizens in the community, right? And most importantly, we need to pray for those, again, who God has placed over us in every area of our life, government, church, work, family, and it goes on. And then in verse 4, speaking of the government, he says, For he, whomever God has pointed over us, is God's ministers, God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now, wouldn't that be nice if that was truly what our government did? But California, not so much. <laughs> it seems as though it's opposite. But in the Roman Empire, criminals were typically executed by beheading with the sword. And then crucifixion was reserved for the lowest of the low criminals, for the worst criminals. So here in this verse, the sword is a reference to what we would call today the death penalty. 
meaning that the Bible teaches that the state or the government has the authority to carry out the death penalty. And I know a lot of people are, are like, oh, no, it doesn't say that in the Bible. This is exactly what it's talking about. You can go back to the Old Testament as well and see where it is definitely talked about. And then in verse 5, Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for consciousness' sake. In other words, you need to be subject because the government is supposed to be able to execute wrath, but also we have a conscience by the power of the Holy Spirit. We know that it is just the right thing to do because God puts it in our heart. For verse 6, because of this, because of our conscience, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Again, wouldn't that be nice if our tax money was going to take care of society rather than I just heard on the news that our military officials are using millions of tax money, or they have, to hire prostitutes for their own pleasure. I mean, it's just crazy what's going on. But yet we are to pay taxes. And you know what? They will stand before God. He's the lion and the lamb. And if we don't bow our knee today and confess that Jesus is Lord one day, soon and very soon, we all will. And they will have to stand before God on that. We don't. We are called to pay taxes. That's what we're called to do. So the government is to use our tax money to restrain evil and keeping society safe. Therefore, in verse 7, render to all their due. In other words, pay them your taxes. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to who customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Now, this is clearly speaking of our attitude as well as actions, as we are to have that attitude of submission, to respect those who God has placed in authority over us as a spirit-filled believer. We can't do this on our own because we have opinions, right? But we are to set aside our opinions and do what God has called us to do. Now, this idea of paying taxes, it was hotly debated a few years back, even in the church. I used to, I know someone close to me that was like, I'm not paying taxes, and he cited the 1895 um, amendment that was never ratified by Congress, meaning that it's unconstitutional for them to make us pay taxes. And then they would say, the way they spend our money is not biblical, so I'm not paying taxes. They send, spend it on abortions and drug programs, illicit sexual education in our schools, uh, worldly indoctrination of our children. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I'm not paying them my taxes. And while those are really good reasons, the bottom line is the Bible commands us to pay taxes, and we are to honor those who pl are placed in authority over us. And, and besides, if we don't pay taxes, we're going to jail, right? So I guess if you want to sign up for prison ministry, go for it. <laughs> but I think it all boils down to trusting God and serving His way, not our way, but His way. Did you ever think of paying taxes as serving God? It is, because God tells us to do so. And that should be our attitude because we're all, again, going to stand accountable for God for only our own actions and our own attitudes. Now, God doesn't call us to agree. He calls us to obey. He calls us to honor. He calls us to respect. And that's only, only possible as we keep our eyes on Jesus and pray without ceasing, as we present our bodies those living sacrifices, allow him to transform our mind for his glory not only man in general are we to obey, but the laws of the land and the leadership. Now, the leadership will always let us down. You guys, can you attest to that? People will always let us down. But as we set an example to honor and submit, not only outside the church, but within, we will bring, be bringing glory to God. Well, that's the first section of chapter 13. And now the second sec section today, Paul revisits the issue of agape, from chapter 12 in Romans 12, 8, or 13, 8. He clearly states in verses 8 through 10, the law of love, the law of agape. And then he continues in verses 11 through 14 to tell us how we are to live by love. Now, following the thought of verse 7, that we all owe a debt and all being debtors to the law, we're all debtors of love as Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets on our behalf. Our account has been filled to overflowing with the love of God. 
And because of that, it is to spill out on all those I come in contact with. Last weekend at the Wind Leaders Lead Conference, the, it was on love. It dovetailed with our study so well, and it was so powerful and so cutting to the heart and so convicting, but so encouraging and so uplifting. But Cheryl's prayer as she met with us, she was saying, you know, I realize I, I, she was talking about how she's so shy and how she realizes she needs to start being more active and showing love to the people she comes in contact with. And her prayer was, Lord, move my lips you filled my heart, but move my lips to express your love to others. Let them know how much they are loved through this vessel and help me to fulfill my debt to others by loving them tangibly. And what a beautiful prayer that is. As God has given us his love, what are we doing with it? Is it just for me and him? Or is it for me to receive from him to give to others? As we are his hands, we are his feet, we are his mouthpiece. That was a beautiful admonition. And then in verse 8, Oh, nothing, add no one anything except love to one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Isn't that beautiful? If you want to fulfill the law, if you want to be legalistic, just love. And you've fulfilled it through Jesus. Now, while it's not good to go into material debt, and some people use that as the the context here, that we should owe nothing to anyone, but that's not what's what Paul's speaking of. He's not speaking of material money or material goods. Instead, he's speaking of the debt of love, as we saw from last week. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4, 7, he says, but the end of all things is at hand. I don't, did you know that the end of all things is at hand? Did you know that time is drawing short? He says, therefore, because of that fact, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love one for another. For love will cover a multitude of sin. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. It covers. How many times do we keep a record of wrongs? Well, she said this and she said that. And I, you know what? That's it. Yet God has called us, just let love cover it. Let God vindicate. Let God take care of it. And he's so much better than we are. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. John 13, 35, it says that it's by this love, this agape, that all will know that you are my disciples if you have agape for one another. So if we're truly walking in God's love, the commandments of the Lord will not be burdensome because he fulfilled them. And in verse 9, he names a few of the commandments. He says, you shall not commit adultery. If you are walking in God's love, you will be sexually pure. You will not have your eyes sexually attracted to other men. No flirting. If you're married, your husband gets all of your love and your attention. As you cherish him as a gift from God. So if you are walking in love, you will not commit adultery. And then it, you shall not murder. And then you think, woo, I'm glad that's in there because I certainly haven't murdered anybody. I'm doing good on this list. But you know what? I just murdered someone yesterday with my heart. I was so upset because I see them going towards sin and destroying the lives of people around them. And it makes me grieved, but yet I just, wanna, I just want them to go away. And that's wrong. I need to be praying for them and showing them love. You shall not steal. If you're walking in God's love, you will not steal. You won't take what is not yours, but rather you will rejoice in what other people have. You know, I think women are the worst at this when it comes to marriage. We look at someone else's marriage and we think, man, her husband is amazing. But I got news for you. God's not going to bring you her husband. God's brought you your husband. And as you invest in respecting and honoring your husband, he will become what my granddaughter calls awesome, amazing, awesome and amazing all together. And that is the truth. Well, it says, you shall not bear false witness. We shall not lie. We won't um, slander someone. We won't gossip. We're to be honest and upfront and have integrity. In all that we do, if we're truly walking in love. And it goes back to last week, as Paul told us to have a sober view of ourselves. 
you know, I got enough junk in my own heart that if I'm truly being sober about my own life, I'm not going to have time to talk about other people or to tear one another down. We'll leave others alone if we are truly being sober about ourselves. And then he says, you shall not covet or be jealous of others. This is speaking of our thought process, and it's the one area that only God sees. In Jeremiah 17.10, it tells us that God knows the minds and the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And if there are any other commandment, he goes on. So he's including all 613 laws, all of the do's and the don'ts listed in the Old Testament. It says that they are all summed up in this saying, namely, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, none of us hate ourselves. It's proof here today. We all got up and fixed our hair and put makeup on and got dressed. We love ourselves. We pamper ourselves. Do we love other people the same way that we love ourselves? That's what he's telling us to do. And in verse 10, because love does no harm to a neighbor. This is heavy. Ask yourself, what are you saying? The accusations you're making or the attitude that you have, are they bringing harm to your brother or sister in Christ? If so, you're not abiding in love. I am so guilty of this. And it is convicting. Therefore, he says, love is the fulfillment of the law. So again, it's God's made it really simple. It's difficult, yet so simple. If we're abiding in love and paying the debt of love, not just towards God but others, we're free from all the other laws. How many of you want to hold up the all 100 or 613 laws? I didn't think so. It's much easier to just say, God, help me die. Fill me with your love so that I can love others. And making love a priority. And seriously, today, as we have application for our own heart, who is it that's wronged you? You all have someone in your mind. I know. Somebody has wronged you because that's just what we do. We wrong each other because, you know why? We're sinners. And we fall short of the glory of God day after day after day, moment by moment. Why not let love cover? Test yourself. Do you fight to prove that you're right? Who cares who's right? The only time we know we're right is when we're loving each other. Amen? Now, there's a lot at stake for Christians, as we have seen, that the world and other believers are watching us. And as we allow God's love to cover the wrongs done to us, it shows that we respect and honor one another as God's children because we are all God's children. Again, it goes back to being the body of Christ and working together in unity. And then in verse 11, it says, We are to do this knowing the time, that now is a high time to wake out of sleep, for now our salvation or the completion of our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. In other words, Jesus could come at any time. So we are to wake up our senses. They need to be sharp. Think about it. When we sleep, we're not awake. I know, that's brilliant. But (laughs) we're asleep. We don't talk intelligibly. I talk in my sleep all the time. And Clark's like, what were you talking about? I'm like, I don't know. He's like, you said something about this. I I have no idea. I don't remember anything. I was not intelligent. Poor Clark. He snores and I talk. It's a horrible thing. My grandkids hate sleeping with us because they're like, you guys are so noisy. (laughs) We just, I, I get all my aggression out at night. I have all my conversations at night so that I can love everybody during the day. No. When I'm asleep, I don't hear anything unless it's loud enough to wake me up. Sometimes I have conversations with Clark, like, are you really serious right now that you're not waking yourself up? And he doesn't wake up because he's snoring. But anyway, I snore too, so it's not throwing him under the bus. I don't know why I just shared that. But (laughs) when we are asleep, we are not awake. And I don't think clearly when I'm asleep. I am not walking or moving forward when I am asleep. I am sedentary. And so Paul tells us in verse 12 of Romans 13, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. In other words, wake up because the rapture will happen in a twinkling of an eye at any time. The question is, are you living like that? Are you living like you may see your Savior at any moment? Or are you just cruising through life, having fun and partying? Because you know what? It's like those young virgins that didn't have their lamps ready. He's going to come and we're going to go, what happened? It's too late. 
because he's warning us. He says, wake up, be alert, I'm coming. And because Jesus could come any time, he goes on and says, therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Ephesians 6.11 tells us that we're to put on the armor of God. And down in verse 14, he says to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our armor. We don't piece him out. We just put on the Lord Jesus. Now, I know it's elementary, but when I get dressed in the morning, I have to take my pajamas off, right, in order to put on my clothes. And that's the idea here. It's the same spiritually speaking. Spurgeon said the rags of sin must come off if we are to put on the robe of Christ, or else it will be an idle attempt to wear religion as a sort of celestial overall over the top of old sin. Jesus called it being whitewashed tombs, hypocritical, where you want to look good on the outside, but yet you're full of dead men's bones. You're full of sin and debauchery. But Christ says, come to me so that I can clean you from the inside out, as we saw last week with being transformed. I so don't want to be a whitewashed tomb. I want God to do the heart surgery in my heart, to fill me with his spirit so that I will be ready that I will be awake and watching as my Savior comes back for me. And in verse 13, he says, let us walk properly. How do we walk properly? In love. As in the day, for all to see as in the light, not in revelry. Now, this is very interesting as you put this together with our government. Because revelry means rioting. What are we seeing in the streets today on increase? Times are getting short. The Bible says it's going to happen. We are to be in peace even when we disagree. And there's drunkenness. And, and, and we're to be soberly, as we saw last week, as Ephesians tells us, do not be drunk with wine. Do not be under the influence of drugs and alcohol, but rather, stark contrast, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit under his divine influence, and not in lewdness. Now, this word lewdness means chambering. It literally means living together, having a sexual relationship when you are not married. It means having sex outside of marriage, carrying the idea that they no longer care what people think. It doesn't matter what God says. They're going to openly flaunt their sin. And it says to not be in lust, not to be sexually impure, which starts again in the mind. And we are not to contend or be in strife or be contentious or wrangle with debates, nor operate in envy. In fact, James tells us that where there's envy, there's jealousy and every evil thing. That's heavy. Don't envy, don't be jealous. But again, instead, of these negative attributes, in verse 14, it tells us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the love of God for others and make no provision for your flesh to fulfill its lust. So how can we do this? Practically speaking, how can we fulfill the debt of love that we owe? The debt of love to God first and then others. Well, I think we all know the answer. It's not by my ability. It's not by your ability because we are not capable of doing this. It's not a love that we can conjure up on our own. It is the love of God. There's no good thing in me. I need to clean myself out to die so that God can fill me. Instead, Paul tells us that it's by the mercies of God as I keep myself on the altar as a living sacrifice. I'm alive on the altar, but I'm presenting myself as that sacrifice, allowing him to transform me by the renewing of my mind. Are you guys sick of living the way we've been living? Are you tired of a mediocre Christian life? Thinking the things that you've been thinking? I mean, maybe you're not like me and you're wonderful and you're filled with love and you're perfect, and that's great. But I'm tired of battling those darts that come and shoot into my mind. I want to be filled with that love. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind, bringing every thought unto captivity. And you know what? We can right now because of the spirit of our living God. As we choose by the mercies of God to present ourselves to God for him to work in and through our lives, 
being continually filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can be free to die to self and to live for love, not just when it's convenient so that the world will know that we belong to him. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that you would help us. God, we are so tired of sleepwalking through this Christian life. I know I am. And I pray, God, right now that you would send your spirit to just fall afresh upon us. God, I know that these ladies love you, but God, would you help us to fall in love with you? Lord, receiving the agape, the unconditional love that you have given to us, Lord. Help us to love with the love that you've loved us with. As that song says, God, that is our heart's cry to you today. Father, we pray that you would help us, Lord, in our shortcomings. As we are squirming around on the altar, help us to just die to ourselves. Lord, that you can fill us with with all that you have for us. As we make up the body of Christ, help us to come together in unity. Come together to edify one another, to build one another up. Help our speech to be seasoned with grace for those that are hearing. God, help us to stop the murmuring, stop the complaining, and to give thankfulness to you, God, because we are to give things to you. That's another thing that is the will of God in Christ Jesus for our lives. God, convict our hearts and replace the old with the new. Help us to wake up, to be alert, because God, you are on your way. So Lord, we thank you and we praise you that we belong to you, and we thank you that today is nearer than when we first believed. We are headed home to that eternal dwelling that you have for us, Lord, where we will be with you for all of eternity, basking in your love. Help us to practice your love now, we pray. In Jesus Christ's most precious name, and all of God's women say, amen.